Dear God, we pray now that you will bless your words to our hearts. We come empty. We come beseeching you for your grace. Thank you for your embrace. Thank you for your love demonstrated on the cross. Lord, we pray now that you will bless your words to our hearts. Glorify yourself. We pray in Jesus' name and God's people say, Amen. 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 Last week we began the series Walking with God in Changing Times. We did not seem to need any convincing that we are living in changing times. We're living in some disturbing times. And you know everything. At least the main facts of a reality is that we're struggling with various diseases, whether medical or social or political or otherwise. And so we continue in our series this morning. Last week we spoke of the man by the name of Abram, exalted father. Today we're going to talk about the man Abraham, the father of many nations. Let me give a little introduction. Normally I would start with a joke. And I realize I have not been telling any jokes recently. I checked myself and I realized that these are no times for jokes. Maybe it's because of how things have been impacting me personally. But I think the Lord is saying to us that these are some serious times. It was in 1997, some 23 years ago, long before there was a George Floyd, there was an immigrant from Haiti by the name of Abner Louima. At the time, he was 31 years old. And apparently Abner went to a nightclub and there was an altercation. There was some problems, a, a group of people. You know how those settings are, those of you who don't know nothing about that. You, you go to a nightclub, somebody's intoxicated, something is going to happen. And there was some scuffle. The police were called and, and Abner Luima was arrested. Long before there was a George Floyd, there was a Abner Luima. And during the ride to the station, the arresting officers beat Luima with their fists and with their nightsticks and handheld police radios. On arriving at the police station, the station house, they had him strip searched. And they had him put in a holding cell, and they continued beating him, culminating with his being sexually assaulted in the bathroom of the precinct. One police officer kicked him in his private parts, and while his hands were cuffed behind the back, they grabbed him and squeezed him in his private parts, and sexually assaulted him with a broken broomstick. We would say sodomize for my wanting not to get so graphic an account of children listening in. 
According to trial testimony, one of the officers walked through the precinct holding up the bloody excrement-stained instrument in his hand, and he was bragging to the sergeant, and he said, Sarge, I took a man down tonight. Louima's teeth were also badly damaged in the attack. Could we show the picture of that, please? And when the broom handle was jammed in his mouth, Yes, there were some protests by a few civil rights groups here and there. But back then, protesters were considered troublemakers. And I remember to this day how I felt. I remember the deafening silence this was national news, and there was a deafening silence from the church. I remembered because this made an impact on me as a newly arriving immigrant to the United States. I remember how I felt. And I remember it was not just the sodomy and the torture and the brutality. It was the silence of the church that really got me going. And in fact, I remember thinking, I remember thinking, do I need to go to church this Sunday to worship God and to praise God while this was going on? I remember thinking, Lord, what is your will? I remember feeling ashamed of myself. That I was a part of a church that said nothing. And yet the Sunday morning I was preparing to go to church to worship. I remember sensing that something was wrong. And this day, even to this day, I sense it. When we hear of the other situations and Sunday mornings, we come out not just about police brutality. This is not what this sermon is about. We're going to get there. In fact, this is it. We come to church and we worship and we praise the Lord. And yet the stains of injustice are on our hands because we are so silent. And I remember... I said, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me and those I call my brothers and my sisters. Forgive the way in which we seek to understand worship. As if to say worship was separate and apart from what we do in our daily lives. As if to suggest that worship is in fact something different. Worship only happens on a Sunday. And then I ask myself, how do I go now to worship? I remember being convicted by the word Isaiah chapter 1. You've heard me quote this a lot. The multitude of your sacrifices, God said, what are they to me? I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fatted Animals, I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked you this? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense, you're detestable to me. These things are detestable. Your new moons, your sabbaths, your convocations, your worthless assemblies. Your festivals, I hate with all my being, 
they have become a burden to me. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. And then God says in chapter, in chapter 1, Isaiah, verse 16, Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. My friends, it was long ago that I understood that there is a connection between how we worship and how we behave ourselves. It was long ago. It was before. Thank God I had a, a, a mother who sat us down, who took us to Sunday school. I understood that God was not necessarily interested in our stuff. God was more interested in the sacrifice of praise and worship that we give, not only from our hearts, but also in the way we behave ourselves. Let me say this. Embedded within our Methodist history and tradition is the expectation that we engage an unjust society. I know some of you walk up to me and say, Pastor Paul, why are we even talking about this? And I say, I say, the Methodist church did not leave you. You left the Methodist church. We need to reclaim, we need to recapture what it means to worship in spirit and in truth and in purity and in justice. We need to understand that worship is not only a connection that I have with God, a bowing in the presence of God, but after I am released from my knees, then I treat my brothers and my sisters with dignity. So the question is... <laughs> Will we continue walking with God even in changing times? And what do we mean by walking with God? It does not mean religiosity. It does not mean fancy clothes and going to church. It does not even mean singing the praises of God if our hearts are not in the right place. And we're going to get the lesson from Abraham. How will we show our love of God and each other? In our worship. Certainly one of the lessons from Genesis chapter 22. Is that in changing times our identity and purpose. Remember we talked about that last week. Our identity and purpose as Christians must be demonstrated. Must manifest itself boldly in the things that hinge upon our unceasing and complete worship of God. And that worship, Abraham tells us, is anchored in two things. First of all, it's anchored in our offering our best. Offering our best. Absolute surrender. Listen to the passage Chapter uh, verse 2 says, then God said, chapter 22 verse 2, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain, I will show you. God, you, you, you're working with Abraham like you did when he was Abraham. You said, get up and go and I will show you. Now God is saying, sacrifice your son and go and I will show you exactly where I want this to take place. My friends, worship is offering our best. Come with your best game. Come with your best uh, 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 personality. Come with your best efforts. Do not give God some kind of halfway mediocre service. Do not suggest to me that whatever is going on outside is no business of yours. 
Do not suggest to God that, God, I'm only a Christian on Sunday. The rest of the week, well, I can do whatever I want. Do not suggest that because God is saying through the story of Abraham and Isaac that your worship should be about offering your best. Your best. Your best. A burnt offering back in the day meant the word itself suggests to cause to ascend along with the smoke to God. So picture the burnt offering and picture the, 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 the sacrifice on the altar and, and the smoke that is rising up. Picture yourself rising up with the smoke toward God, toward some, some, some place out there where God resides. Offer yourselves as sacrifice and offer your best deal. Give your best to God. It was a sacrifice offered to achieve forgiveness. It was an acknowledgement that God, I live amongst people with unclean lips. I live among institutions that need reform. I live, my own people are, are messed up. I need, I need to offer a burnt sacrifice, a burnt offering. I need to worship you not only on Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I need to worship you and I need to offer you you my best because I've got sins so when God said go sacrifice Abraham didn't fuss and fight Abraham didn't say well Lord I go to church religiously every Sunday because Abraham knew that he was not perfect. Abraham knew that he may have committed some unintentional sins. He may have committed sins of which he was unaware. He may have been unconscious about the stuff he was doing to people, let alone the conscious stuff he did to people. You know, I was sharing this with a few people, a couple people this week when for reasons that I won't talk about, I needed to go into the social services area of government and I need to talk to some people. Can somebody please tell me why? Can anybody tell me why is it that sometimes you go for help on behalf of somebody or somebody else or yourself and some of these people in government act as if it's their money? Can somebody tell me why we are so rude to each other? Can somebody tell me why people sit there with attitude as if, what you're coming for? Hey, you're there to service. You're there to bring your best. You're there to offer. And whatever you do is a part of the justice system of which we claim we are Americans. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship. <laughs> we will worship and then we will come back to you. We're going to worship. The, 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 the offering of, of, of the, the burnt offering is our, is our act of worship. God said to me, but I'm not going to disclose where my where my, where my sacrificial lamb is coming from. God told me, actually, it was my son Isaac. How do I feel about that? Well, I have to walk on faith. If I give God my best, I have to walk on faith. You don't get to hold back your best. You don't get to hold back your best intentions. You don't get to hold back your, your best strategy. You don't get to hold back your best effort. You don't get to hold back what you got and what you value and what you cherish because that belongs to God and your act of worship is giving that up to God. The church say amen. We don't get to decide that we hold back the best and we like some people, but we don't like other people. Giving to God and worship to God, as Abraham is teaching us, is about offering our best. It's absolute surrender. It is about let it go, let it go, let it go. Give it to God because God needs it. And when God has it, then you and God, you're in right favor. You're in proper favor. Don't come to church acting like this is favor. This is not favor because I don't know where my heart is unless I check my heart. You don't know where your heart is unless you check your heart. The favor that God wishes 
to see and God wants to see is when our hearts are straight up, straight up right with God, where we can say, God, I'm going to give you my best. I'm going to totally surrender everything I have to you. Paul said in Romans 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, I urge you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's your due. It's what's due to God. You don't get to compartmentalize yourself. You don't get to say you're Democrat and Republican. You don't get to say you're rich and you're poor. You don't get to say you're black and you're white. You don't get to say anything unless you are giving up the best to God. Hmm. Worship is offering our best. The implications, my friend, for worship is that as we come to God, we offer our best in order to deal with our sins. It comes back to that. It comes back to that. So the first thing Abraham is teaching us on this journey, as we walk with Abraham in worship, as we walk with Abraham, as we journey with Abraham, is that we offer our best. Secondly, worship is not just about offering our best. It's about obtaining our blessing. Obtaining our blessing. Not only is there absolute surrender, but there is abundant supply. We obtain our blessing. Verse 13, Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, remember, he's about to kill his son. He was about to kill his son. And Abraham looked up and, and in, in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horn. He went over and took the ram, sacrificed it. But verse 14 is even more dynamic. It says, So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. Obtaining our blessing, we first need to surrender everything. Remember some months ago we did that series on the Beatitudes and we said your blessings, your blessings do not come when you give monies to these, to these pastors who are preaching and telling you about seed faith, this nonsense about give me money so that I buy another jet. Your blessing does not come that way. That is not scriptural. When it comes, it comes through your obedience to God in doing what God wants you to do. It is not about the money. The money will come. The money will be there. But it's not just about money. And this is the problem with wrong theology. You set people up to believe that when I give my money, then I'm over. I'm done. Then I can do whatever I need to do. That is nonsense. Your life is at stake. God is weighing us in the balance. And according to scriptures, many of us have been found wanting. We lopsided. We're not there yet. And so when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus was referring to deep, beggarly, cowardly, crouching, bending over, deeply destitute, completely lacking resources, helpless as a beggar. And that's how Abraham felt when he had to present his son to God. God, this is all I have. This is the the inheritance. This is the promise you said. I will multiply and I will be father of great nations and, and my name will spread. Remember last week, we, we, we talked about naming. We, 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 we talked about how our names are going to be called blessed because we touch lives in future generations. And God, Abraham is saying, God, I don't understand this, but I'll work with you. My memory, my mind can't comprehend, but I'll work with you by faith. 
I am destitute, I'm poor, I'm dependent on you by your grace. Your grace is sufficient and I understand that when I put myself in your hands, then I obtain my blessings because you have an abundance in terms of supply. Dirt poor. That's how Abraham felt. Dirt poor. That's where we need to be. Dirt poor in terms of not just money, but in terms of just had attitude. Just where we need to be. You give over your best. You present your best to God. And now tell me how you feel. You feel as if you now have to depend on God, don't you? You feel as if you can't run around bragging anymore because God has your stuff. You feel as if you have given over everything to God. You feel like a pauper, not just a peasant, but a pauper. You dirt poor, you poor. Not too proud to beg poor. Not too proud to stand on the side of the road and beg poor. Totally empty, totally drained before God. You see, one receives the advantages from God when one is absolutely and totally dependent on God. That was our point one. The blessings come and the abundance out of God's abundance and we are yet to see what God can do. So when we fussing about money, when we fussing about this and we fussing about that, we need to surrender everything we have. Dedicate is another way to put that. Dedicate everything you have. I don't care what kind of job you have. I don't care how much money you got in your bank account. Dedicate all that to God because God wants to use what you got. God wants to use you. God wants to use me. God wants to use my heart. And even if we possess stuff, the stuff belongs to God. So if you're listening to me out there in TV land or wherever you are, not because you're working for government or some institution, not because you voted for some politician, does not mean that you need to be nasty. It does not mean you need to be uh, 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 disrespectful of other people in whom the dignity of God resides. Bring your A game. Bring your best. Surrender your best. Surrender yourself because that is your reasonable act of worship. And so Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let me finish my story about the social services. I shared this with a couple of people. There was one lady I called eventually, and she was so nice. I won't call her name. I won't give her a shout out. I'm tempted, but I won't right now. She was so nice. I, I thought I was in heaven. I thought I was in heaven. Have you been through some, some problems sometimes and you wonder, Lord, where is your angel? Who are you going to send now to deliver me? Who are you going to send to keep me from becoming discouraged because I got people to take care of? Who are you going to uh, send to help me? And God sent this one angel. And she said, don't worry about it, Mr. Lawson. She didn't even know I was pastor. Because I don't dress like this when I go out. You know that. And I almost started crying. That God would put someone with a kind word. Y'all, let me, let me tell you this. This is no joke. Maybe you have not been there. Maybe you, you, you can't even relate to what I'm talking about. Maybe, I don't know. But you see when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. You depend on God to bring light to your life. It could be a family member. It could be a total stranger. This time, God just decided, you know what? Let me throw in one of my angels, Pastor Paul. I know this was a rough week for you. Let me just throw you in one of my angels. And that angel walked with me through the process. 
Don't blame COVID-19 for your nastiness. Don't blame the long hours that you have to work. Don't blame the pressure you're under. Don't blame your spouse. Don't blame your children or grandchildren. You treat people right. You give your best. You present your best. And then God will bless you. God will take care of the rest. Victorious Christian living is recognizing and practicing your absolute and total dependence on God. It was Job, wasn't it, who said, naked I came into the world and naked I will return. When he lost everything, when he gave up everything, when God took everything from him, he still did not curse God and die as was suggested. He gives more grace. Let's not forget that. When there's sin around, he gives more grace. When the sin multiplies and the injustice multiplies, he gives more grace and more grace. Because his grace has no measure. His love has no limit. We're talking about abundant supply. We're, we're talking about making sure that we get the blessings that God has in store for us. Lord, please forgive us. Please forgive us when we have acted as if depending on you is something to be ashamed of. I'm about to close, but like you, I have thought about Isaac. I wonder what that young boy was thinking. In verse 7, the first time he spoke up, and you know it was speaking up out of respect. Not like some of these kids today, cussing you out. Mama this, mama that, you this, you that. You know Isaac spoke up the first time we heard him through this journey. In verse 7, he spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, Abraham looked and said, yes, son. As if Abraham was already figuring out, because his son was smart. His son figured, his son said, look, 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 the fire, the fire and wood are here, but where's the lamb? Those police officers who tortured Abner Luima. I sometimes wonder what's their family background? I sometimes wonder how they were raised, what training they received. And you can go Google this, folks. There are a lot of cases of injustices in this world. But I believe that what Isaac learned was that his daddy was so devoted to God that his daddy was willing to give him up to God. <laughs> I don't know how I would have felt about that as Isaac. But can you imagine what impact that may have had on Isaac? Because we went on. He went on to become the father of Esau and Jacob. He went on to continue the lineage from which we got Jesus. What impact would something like that have had on a young mind? When your father is willing to give you up to God. Give up his best to God. Can you imagine the faith journey Isaac went on? And most importantly, Isaac must have learned that God will provide. God will provide. The days might get dark, my friends, and, and, and people might walk away from you and you might be in turmoil and you might be confused as to what is happening in this world today, right here, right now. But God will provide Jehovah Jireh. My provider, his grace is sufficient for us. Amen. I'll leave you with a few closing thoughts. The more you hold back on God, the less will your blessings be. 
We want to play that game? Go right ahead. Pastor Paul, if you hold back on God, what you know you should be giving God, your time, your talent, your technology, your tools, your, 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 your whatever. Whatever you hold back from God, you're holding back your own blessing. Smarty pants. Like Abraham, as you grow in your walk with God, the act of worship brings more blessings and you understand how to, how to worship. You understand that when you come to worship, you come to give of yourself. Be prepared for that. It's not just walking into a sanctuary and seating and sitting in the pews. That's not worship. Worship is giving of yourself. And the things you hold dear and near to your heart. Don't try to take shortcuts with your loyalty to God. Some of us are trying to play this game with God. Well, God, I'll just give you a little right now. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll hold back on something. God says, okay, you hold back, I'm going to hold back. When your time of sickness comes... I hope you remember you held back on me. Don't follow anyone, folks, who is not going anywhere spiritually. I'll say this till the day I die. I've seen so many cases, so many people follow after some people who have no, 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 no semblance of godliness in their lives. Changing times do not mean that you need to change your principles and your values. Changing times does not mean that you need to cut back on your devotion to God. In fact, this is when we need to engage God, like we said last week. Now is the time to seek God. Now is the time to seek the Lord. Those of you who are listening in from home, if there's anyone who has not yet had this experience with Jesus, I, I recommend Jesus. I am a Christian. I recommend Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father, the Bible says, except through Christ. Mm -hmm.